Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Kalaszewski, Member Programs Lead at the League, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is titled New Pandemic Order, What It Means for Your Community. Michigan is under a new three-week epidemic order issued by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and announced recently by Governor Whitmer. The order has multiple parts, and the Michigan Municipal League has asked legal experts from the Miller Canfield Law Firm to break it down for all of our members. A few notes before we get started. Following the presentation, I will be facilitating a Q&A session with participants. To submit questions, please type them in the chat box on the upper left side of your screen. And following today's presentation, we will also email any links or slides referenced here. So you will get a copy of this presentation afterward. Now I'd like to formally introduce our speakers today. We've got Camille Robakievich, uh, who specializes in litigation and alternative dispute resolution with a particular emphasis on labor and employment disputes. He has considerable experience in conducting investigations for public sector and higher education institutions. Prior to joining Miller Canfield, Camille served as a law clerk to the Honorable James L. Dennis of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Thank you for joining us, Camille. Thank you. We also have Nan Ho, associate from the Miller Canfield Law Firm. Nan Ho's practice concentrates on employment discrimination, leave rights, and wage and hour litigation and disputes. She regularly counsels employers on their policies and practices to address specific challenges in the workplace. Nan was previously an intern for the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. Thank you for joining us today, Nan, and I will turn it over to the two of you to begin. Thank you so much, um, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, we always appreciate uh, spending some time with the Michigan Municipal League. Um, you all do great work, and we really enjoy our partnership. So um, as Emily mentioned, I'm Camille, and then with me is Nan. Uh, Nan is really the one of the premier experts on all of these executive orders and related um, legislation and uh, agency directives. Um, so very fortunate to have her with us. She knows this stuff forwards, backwards, and upside down. So, um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have, and Nan will, uh, of course, assist as well. Um, if you have questions, we'll probably do those, uh, as Emily mentioned, at the end. So just a little brief um, information about our firm. We are, I believe, the oldest full-service law firm in the state of Michigan. Um, we've been around for a long time, and we uh, work with municipalities on all sorts of topics, whether they be labor and employment or um, bond work or um, you know real estate, a whole slew of things. So um, always a pleasure to work with everybody here. Briefly, um, we wanted to, of course, discuss the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services uh, directive that was issued and went into place yesterday. Um, first off, I just want to go through some of the key definitions in that directive, as well as then we'll talk about the various restrictions on gatherings. There are quite a few exceptions to those restrictions, so we'll want to go through the biggest ones, um, then the restrictions on schools, and of course, how these uh, directives will be enforced. So first of all, very important to Keep in mind that this uh, directive has a three-week time limit. Um, so it went into force yesterday and then will um, no longer be in place as of midnight on December 8th. Um, a few key definitions here that everyone should be familiar with. The term household comes up a lot in uh, the directive in this one and quite a few others. Um, and so they felt the need to define that term, which I think is helpful. So it's a, a group of people living together with common kitchen or bathroom facilities um, generally is the term definition of household. So you'll see there's no specific reference to whether there are, people are in the same family. Um, there is a further definition for uh, individuals who live in, if it's multiple families, 
of 25 or more people who share uh, common or kitchen bathroom facilities, then in that case, it becomes people who share a bedroom. But this, this general definition that's there is the one that probably applies in most cases. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services also defined face mask. Um, no big surprises here, but you know, different people seem to try to fit in uh, within the term face mask and things that might not fit. Um, so that's a little bit clarified there. One thing that's important to note here is that um, a face shield specifically is not considered a face mask. The DHHS does say that uh, face shields are helpful, but that they cannot be used in place of a face mask. So um, they suggest that they can be used in addition to a face mask or, um, for example, for young children who are exempt from the face mask requirement that a face shield could be uh, a good idea. But the, it still has to be a face mask and not a face shield. Uh, importantly, the definition of employee specifically includes independent contractor. So when you are um, counting up the number of individuals, number of employees, um, independent contractors are included within any of those counts. And then a very important uh, term that comes up a lot is gathering. So a gathering is defined as two or more people from um, to multiple households that uh, are either in a shared indoor or outdoor space. Um, the directive specifically does not define the confines of what a shared space means, either indoor or outdoor, and um, has said that it kind of left that ambiguous uh, intentionally, but that people should err on the side of uh, a shared space being kind of more expansive rather than limited. Then there's also a definition of symptoms of COVID-19 here. Uh, a lot of the previous executive orders and directives have just kind of referenced the CDC guidelines, and those, of course, have changed. Um, and our understanding of the symptoms of COVID-19 have changed. But here, it, uh, symptoms of COVID-19 is specifically defined, and it's, I'd say, a pretty broad definition. So at least one of fever, uncontrolled cough, or new shortness of breath, um, any one of those is considered a symptom of COVID-19. And then there's a list of kind of secondary symptoms where you need two, um, and those are a loss of taste or smell, muscle ache, sore throat, severe headache, diarrhea, vomiting, or abdominal pain. So any two of those um, together constitute a symptom of COVID-19. All right, so um, the two, I mean, the, if you walk away with nothing else, then um, the things that we'll want you to know are that this DHHS directive created a face mask mandate um, and then the other one being that it restricted certain activities uh, gatherings and under certain circumstances so this um, is a change from past practice from the DHHS they previously had recommended face masks um, but now the requirement is that all persons participating in gatherings wear face masks. There are some exceptions here, um, but they're pretty limited. So under the age of five, um, individuals who cannot medically tolerate a face mask, it is not sufficient for somebody to assume that if someone's not wearing a face mask, they must fall within that exception of not being able to medically tolerate it. Um, so, for example, a business uh, cannot say, well, the person wasn't wearing a mask and, you know, we had a sign saying that everyone has to have one. So we assume they must not medically tolerate it. Um, that's not good enough. However, the directive does say that a 
business can take the you know the customer's word for it. So if if they ask the individual and the individual says, I'm not wearing a mask because I can't medically tolerate that, then um, that is enough for businesses to accept that verbal statement. Um, masks aren't required if people are eating or drinking while seated. So um, I believe trying to keep people who are just walking around taking sips of something uh, those individuals need to wear a mask. But if you're actually seated and eating and drinking, um, then the mask is not required. Uh, exercising outdoors. And then uh, religious services. In general, there's a lot of exceptions in the directive for uh, religious practice and religious services. So that's something that you'll see come up a lot. Um, for the most part, if, it's, if it has to do with actual religious practice, um, all of that is generally uh, accepted from the various requirements and mandates in this directive. And then there's a, a specific exception for somebody giving a speech um, as long as there's a maintenance, maintenance of six feet of you know, the social distancing that we've all become accustomed to. Um, there are some additional exceptions um, that I haven't listed here, but these are the main ones. Um, some of the other ones include uh, swimming, which I hope would be obvious that you don't have to wear a mask when you're swimming. Um, some things like asking somebody to temporarily remove a mask for identification purposes, that's allowed. Um, communicating with uh, a person who is deaf or deaf blind or hard of hearing who needs to be able to see somebody's mouth um, in order to uh, facilitate essential communication, that's, uh, that's allowed. Similarly, um, someone at a polling pay place for purposes of voting in an election. But those are kind of less common uh, occurrences. So I didn't list all of them there. These are really the main main exceptions here. Okay, um, so that's the mask mandate. And now I'm gonna get into gatherings here. There's quite a few rules and quite a few exceptions. So um, you'll have to bear with me as we try to get through all of this here. Um, so this slide is for um, residential gatherings. So, you know, people's homes. Um, Indoor gatherings are limited here. They have to be to fewer, 10 or fewer people and limited to two or fewer households. Um, so, you know, a game night with five couples at somebody's house is not allowed, uh, even though it would be 10 or fewer people um, because it would uh, go beyond the household requirement. Similarly, um, if, you know, two households with six people each, uh, you can't do it. Um, of course, if one household has more than 10 people, that's okay because that would not be a gathering under the definition uh, because a gathering would mean two or more households. Um, so that's indoor gatherings. Now, outdoor gatherings, um, there's a little more room here. It's limited to 25 or fewer people um, and three or fewer households. So a little bit more room to maneuver there, but um, but still not a great deal more. All right, and something to keep in mind for all of these gatherings that generally, you know, the mask mandate still is in effect, and then um, requirements for social distancing are generally also still in effect. So um, even though you can gather, you know, you still need to have the masks on. Um, and then non-residential gatherings. So the general rule here is that all non-residential gatherings are prohibited. That's, that's kind of the baseline rule here, which is pretty darn strict. Um, we will get into exceptions. There are quite a few exceptions here, but the rule is, um, you know, unless an exception applies indoor gatherings, uh, in a non-residential space are prohibited. 
outdoor gatherings. There's a difference here between uh, fixed seating and uh, without fixed seating. So in both cases, it's 25 or fewer people, but depending on whether there's uh, six, uh, fixed, seating, fixed seating or not, um, the additional requirement of either two people per 1,000 square feet or a max of 20% of seating capacity applies. Um, we did get a question beforehand, and I thought I'd maybe just raise it or answer it here. Um, in terms of what's indoor versus outdoor, um, the definition, in, not in the actual directive, but in our Q&A, the DHHS has specified what that means. And so uh, outdoor or a, a indoor gathering would be a gathering within any kind of structure um, that has more than one uh, side of it fully or partially enclosed. So that means that um, you can't just throw up a tent with sides on it and call it an outdoor gathering. That would be considered an indoor gathering. Um, so if you're going to have a tent uh, or a canopy, um, it's okay for one of the sides to be partially covered. But if more than one side is even partially covered, then it is uh, than an indoor gathering and uh, not permitted unless an exception applies. All right, um, so now I want to get into the major exceptions here. Um, so the first one that you'll see is um, these incidental or temporary gatherings. The examples that the DHHS gives are, um, you know, people at an airport or bus station or uh, exercise facility, food service establishment, or um, a shopping mall, where it's just kind of natural that every once in a while people, um, not intentionally, but that there becomes a grouping of individuals because of, you know, they're just moving through the same space at the same time. Um, that is not, that that's considered an exception to the general rule here. So the, that kind of incidental or temporary gathering is permitted and wouldn't violate the rule. Um, an important one um, is gathering between an employee and a customer for the purpose of receiving services. So that's a pretty big exception and um, really applies to a lot of business, especially like a retail space. Um, so that's that's a very important one for you know our businesses to continue to function. Um, voting or all their election related activities, um, training of law enforcement or correctional medical or first responder personnel, uh, insofar as those activities cannot be conducted remotely. So those trainings can go forward. That includes like CPR training. Um, it doesn't have to be for a, uh, you know, a physician. It can be just like first responder or CPR training. Um, but again, it, there has to be a determination that that can't take place remotely for it to be allowed. Um, education and support services at um, schools serving pre-K, pre-kindergarten through grade eight, um, those are accepted from the from the directive. Um, similarly, children in a child care organization or camp setting. Um, People traveling on a school bus or in public transit, those are all allowed. Um, gathering for the purposes of medical treatment, including mental health and substance uh, use disorder, support services, those are okay. Um, and then gatherings of up to 25 people for a funeral um, is acceptable under the policy. Importantly, also residential care services. Um, which are subject to a separate epidemic order, um, those are exceptions to this general rule. Okay. So um, some pretty big ones there. Um, and then here's another really big important exception, and this is workplace gatherings consistent to a separate um, MIOSHA, Michigan uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration emergency rule that came out uh, a little over a month ago. And that rule um, 
not going to go through the whole entire thing because that would be kind of a separate presentation. But you should be familiar with that one by now. Um, it has various requirements, and those include um, categorizing job tasks and procedures, and they're like low, medium, and high. Uh, having a specific COVID-19 written policy that's for preparedness and response, um, consistent with OSHA and CDC guidance, um, implementing infection prevention procedures, uh, including prohibiting in-person work to the extent work activities can feasibly be completed remotely. Um, so that's, you know, that's an important uh, piece to remember that um, it's not just, uh, you know, if it'd be more convenient for somebody to do the work uh, or more efficient for them to do it in person, for them to for an employee to be allowed to do the work in the office, there has to really not be feasible for them to uh, complete that task remotely. Um, similarly, uh, you know, the requirements for surveillance of health um, before entry into the workplace and uh, while they're there, PPE, uh, personal protective equipment being provided to employees, all these different uh, requirements that I think that we're all pretty familiar with, but um, but the DHHS order that applies right now specifically uh, creates an exemption for workplace gatherings that are consistent uh, with those specific emergency rules. Okay. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Nan now, and she will take it from here, and then uh, we'll look forward to hearing your questions and answering them. Uh, once she gets through some of the further specific guidance. Thank you, Camille. So the order also um, includes some specific restriction or prohibition on certain types of gathering. Um, we must. No, I think we might ask you to speak up just a little bit if you can. It's a, a little quiet. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the order also includes certain. Um, restriction or prohibition on certain type of gathering. Um, we must note that if your business or your operation doesn't fall within one of these types of um, gathering prohibition, then you must resort back to the general rule of indoor and outdoor gathering. So there are certain type of gathering that are specifically prohibited, such as gathering in entertainment venues, um, including auditorium, movie theater, sorry, banquet hall, conference center, sport venues, gathering in recreational facilities such as amusement park, bingo, hall, bowling, casino is no longer open. Um, gathering in indoor dining in most food service establishments. So most indoor dining in restaurant and bar is now prohibited for the next three weeks. The order, however, um, allows for certain types of gatherings, such as outdoor gathering in parks and outdoor recreation. But like I say, the certain the restrictions for outdoor gathering that Camille talked about still apply in this case. The same outdoor dining is allowed, but the table has to be set six feet apart and maximum six persons to a table. Um, you can actually see what type of gathering is prohibited or is allowed um, by accessing the infographic uh, chart that the Michigan Department of Human Health Service have on their website. It's very helpful for you to see that. Um, we attach a link here um, which will lead you to that. Um, there was some question that was addressed to us prior to this and I will try to address some of them. Um, the first is a large covered tent with flap with sign allowed for outside dining. Um, our answer is likely um, no, unless the large covered tent with flap for sign can be open for three sides. This is because the Michigan Department of Health and Human Service has defined indoor is a space enclosed fully or partially on the top and enclosed fully or partially on more than one side. Um, and that includes temporary structure, such as tent or canopy with sidewall or covering, unless it is open on three sides. 
Um, the Michigan Human, Human How and De Michigan Department of Health and Human Service also explained that a permitted outdoor food service establishment setting could include a single household dining inside of an igloo or as a small enclosed space uh, with, with, you know, with limited visitation uh, from, from employees leading in or not at all. Um, so for, for, for large tents um, with flaps, that probably would not be permit, permitted in this order. Um, and then we also have an order, uh, we also have a question of fitness class. Um, the new order does not allow fitness class to operate how our fitness class is defined. There is no specific definition for fitness class in the new emergency order, but, it, but this would ordinarily mean that it is an organized meeting um, in an exercise facility for the purpose of good work, group workout with an instructor. And then how many people constitute a fitness class? Um, like I said, there is no specific definition of what is a fitness class, but there is a specific definition of gathering, and what is prohibited here is gathering for fitness class. So gathering is defined in the order as um, where two or more persons from more than one household are present in a shared space. So, so this would mean that if more than two people meet from if two or more people from more than one household meet for the purpose of exercise together, that probably would not be permitted. Um, so let's move on. All right. Um, and then there are specific restrictions, prohibition on gathering in school, college, and university, um, high school gathering for instruction, for in person instruction or extracurricular activity. Are mostly prohibited. Um, Pre-K through eight instruction is allowed, but subject to local decision. So subject to the school district um, decision whether to have in-person learning or not. But there would not be any gathering of pre-K to eight for extracurricular activity. And then gathering in college or university, unless permitted um, by the indoor outdoor general rule and organized sport restriction in the emergency order is also not permitted. Organized sport, organized sport can proceed as long as all participants and venue comply with uh, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Service enhanced testing regime. Um, this requirement includes testing up to six times a week, no play, while symptomatic, limited social contact, um, and then there would not be any spectator allowed for organized sport. Um, the rule also included a requirement or continuation of the requirement that the business must maintain record, um, date and time of entry, name and phone number of customer for those who provide personal care services, exercise facilities, and in-home services. Um, those businesses should deny entry if visitors refuse to provide their name and phone number or, re or deny service if they or would, would not provide the information requested. The order, however, imposes an additional requirement on how to maintain, collect, and discard the data collected. Um, so those information must be not be sold and must be protected. Um, and also that it must not be provided, um, it must be retained for at least 20, for 28 days, after which it must be destroyed. Um, and then those data must be provided for, to the Department, Michigan Department of Health and Human Service and local health departments upon request for, con for contact tracing purposes. And lastly is the implementation of this order. Um, local health departments are authorized to carry out and enforce the terms of this order pursuant to the law. Um, police can are uh, specifically authorized to um, investigate potential violence and enforce the order. Um, there is a um, both criminal and civil penalty for failure to follow the order um, for criminal violence. A violation can be punishable by a mis uh, can be either misdemeanor punishable by imprisonment not for not more than six months or a fine of not more than two hundred dollars or both. 
um, for in civil um, violation can um, is is I'm sorry is punishable by a civil fine of up to a thousand dollar for each violation or day that a violation continue. Um, there is an exemption from enforcement for places of worship, allow, allowing for religious worship and person engaging in religious worship in such place are exempt from enforcement. However, places of worship used for all other purposes are subject to the order's mass and gathering requirements, as well as the capacity limit. So I just run through a bunch. I know there has been a bunch of questions. Um, so I'm trying to get there so we have time to talk about those. Yeah, I think that in this particular case, the questions might uh, be a lot more important than just the basic guidelines. So why don't we start moving through the questions, as I believe there are quite a few. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the biggest questions we have is how does this new restriction impact attendance at public meetings for the Open Meetings Act? Yeah. So. Um, Generally, uh, now I can go into a little more detail, but um, public meetings can now take place remotely, um, and the the rules here do apply so um, to public meetings. So uh, it can be up to 25 people if it's outdoors. I'm not sure anyone wants to have a public meeting outside right now. Um, so generally speaking, under this uh, order, the if it's going to be indoors, the public meeting really has to take place remotely. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Nan? No, I agree. So in-person meeting are prohibited under um, unless the meeting is, you know, comply with the outdoor indoor gathering restrictions. And then under the new Public Act 228 of 2020, public meeting may be held virtually under certain specified um, specified circumstances. Excellent. Thank you. Um, regarding enforcement, can you provide the MCL number? Um, that's a question that we've had come in. The MCL and number? Sorry, we can, that's something we can certainly follow up with in the presentation, in the email afterwards as we provide the presentation links. Um, but the MCL number is one question that we got in. Um, sure. So, um, forward, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, so, uh, so it's under MCL 333.2235, um, subparagraph one, that local health departments are authorized to carry out and enforce the terms of the order. Um, and then the order just says that uh, law enforcement officers, as defined by um, MCL 28.602F, are deemed to be department representatives for purposes of enforcing the order. And again, just so everybody knows, we will reference those um, direct numbers in our email that goes out following this presentation, so it's easy for you to find that information. Um, next question, does the 14-day quarantine for close contact with a COVID-positive individual include dispatchers and DPW personnel? Right, so the this uh, order doesn't that specify that information. Um, so I'll leave it to Nan whether there is uh, additional guidance that that could be referenced there. I know that the um, the state and the DHHS in particular have given some kind of uh, inconsistent guidance on the extent to which um, you know necessary personnel are exempt or not exempt from the 14-day requirement but Nan, do you have any more specific information um it is a little bit outside of the scope of this specific order but it is certainly something that we all have to be aware of right so the so the, so the essential worker um typically are not are not subject to the 14 days because they are exposed to a person who has COVID-19 because that's the nature of their job you know, like a nurses or doctor, they are exposed constantly to people who have COVID-19. Um, so, so that's that. Um, I will follow the CDC guidance on that. Um, there is a CDC guidance with regard to how long do you have to stay quarantined and what type of person needs to be stay quarantined. 
Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, the MDHHS is not implying with this order that municipalities must purchase equipment for staff to work from home, is it? No, it's not saying that. Um, and that the piece of having to work from home is um, kind of in that related uh, MIOSHA guidance. But um, the question is of whether it's feasible. So ultimately, it's going to have to be a, a person, personal decision or, a, you know, a business decision for the municipality, whether um, it would consider purchasing that kind of equipment feasible. Um, the fact that it costs something probably isn't enough um, to not follow the mandate. But if uh, if, if the cost is just prohibitive, then um, then you'd certainly have a good argument that that it wasn't feasible under the circumstances. Okay, similarly, um, MDHHS Q&A posted today permits local government offices to be open to the public. If the building is open, does that determination automatically cancel out the remote work mandate for local government office employees? No, um, no, not at all. So the building is open, um, but all the other requirements have to have to still be followed, um, including the, the gathering requirements. Um, there, it's all right for there to be some uh, interpersonal interaction for the purposes of providing, you know, municipal services. But, um, but that doesn't mean that the, the rest of the rules don't apply, they still do. Great, next question. Can you discuss how a ski hill may fit into outdoor activities? How a ski hill is an outdoor activity? Um, so skiing is allowed under the this order. Um, specifically, it's allowed. So there's an encouragement to, um, you know, for seats to be taped off so that there's social distancing on chairlifts and um, and the lodges. There's uh, there's not um, you can gather in lodges and any food at um, a ski resort has to be for takeout only, um, but skiing is still allowed under this order. Excellent. And I just want to confirm, um, we've got a question in again about that Open Meetings Act. Um, has the legislature approved the bill to continue remote meetings as legal into the new year? And I, and I just want to reiterate, yes. Um, and we have more information available on that topic on our website. So we'll be sure to include that um, in the follow-up email. I'm gonna just run through these questions um, again to make sure we've touched on the topics we needed to get through. Um, give me just a moment, because we've had quite a few coming in. So I wanna make sure that we're touching on all of them. Um, can a bar that serves food stay open? So under this order that doesn't, uh, you know, takeout service is fine. And then even, um, uh, you know, uh, some outdoor uh, seating would be fine. The rule, this order does not get into any of those issues about, um, well, so it, it does say that nightclub facilities are closed and can't be open during the pendency of this order. So. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by bar. If the bar would fall within the definition of a nightclub, then it is closed. Um, but otherwise, yes, it can uh, still serve food and, um, you know, especially for takeout and then uh, some outdoor tables if, if you know, people want to brave the weather. Thank you for that information. Um, are social district uh, common areas limited to 25 people? Sorry, social districts? Yes, social district. This might be a question that we have Jen Rick Trink on our legislative staff answer. Um, so we can get back to you with that answer if you, if the two of you on the call don't have um, a history with that topic. So no problem on that one. Um, let me just go yeah, through sorry, it again one more sorry. time. 
No problem. Sorry. Um, we will get back to any of the, it's all right, um, any of the questions that um, our team can answer, we will certainly get back with you on those. Um, but it looks like we have a couple of questions that are coming in regarding um, government buildings remaining open, but remote work being required where it can be. So can you address that a little bit more? Um, we have a, a comment here. They're confused. Government buildings must remain open, but staff must work remotely. So government buildings may remain open. Um, the the order doesn't require them to remain open. They they can remain open. Um, and the in order, if you're able to do the functions of the job remotely, then you're obligated to do that. Um, some some jobs can be done remotely. And uh, if it's a you know a municipal office that requires um, people to be able to come in and you know file paperwork or request documents or something like that, and you need to have a person there in order to uh, make that function, then that is permitted. But if um, the work can be done remotely, then it is required to be done remotely. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I also want to clarify um, from a league standpoint um, in regards to the open meetings, virtual open meetings, um, that piece of legislation expires on December 31st, 2020. Our team, our legislative team is working to extend the no reason virtual meetings into the next year. It will be a lame duck issue. So we'll have more information on that as it comes out. Um, it looks like we've gotten most of these questions answered. We'll go back through them because we've gotten quite a few in. If we haven't answered your question and we can't answer your question, um, we'll make sure we get those to the uh, presenters so that they can answer it um, afterwards. Again, these presentations, this will be um, available on our website following um, the presentation today. I want to give a big thank you um, to our presenters, Camille and Nod, for joining us today to walk us through all of this information Again, we'll make sure this is available to all of you who have um, watched from home afterwards. Um, you can find this in multiple formats for you to review or share on our website at www.mml.org. Um, a few other resources of note, each Monday at noon, we've been conducting our traditional Monday morning live as a working from home series with our lobbying team via webinar. You'll definitely want to be tuning into that as we enter into this next lame duck session. You can jo join those via Zoom or watch live on our Facebook page. Next up in MML series, just make sure you stay tuned for more information. We will continue to update you and offer webinars on these critical topics as, as we um, are able to schedule them. I want to thank you all for joining us today, and that concludes our session. Thank you. Thank you.